as uh, Terry said, uh, that when I learned that the uh, one book was going to be The Sixth Extinction, I was very excited because I'd already been using it in my classes for a couple of years because uh, it's right up my alley. I do work on endangered species. This is a white-breasted thrasher from St. Lucia in the West Indies, where my students have done a couple projects. And I teach uh, courses in conservation biology. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a subset of environmental sustainability, and particularly the subset that's most important to me, which has to do with biodiversity. Um, and that's really what the book focuses on, even though there are other dimensions of sustainability. They all boil down to all the various dimensions of sustainability, boil down to how we as individuals and as the human population have a footprint um, relative to the ecology of the planet. So we use resources, um, so we have our various ways that we rely on natural resources in the environment um, for our energy, our uh, um, housing, um, fibers and timber we use to build things, our food is really important, both uh, uh, agriculture and seafood. So each of us individually through our lifestyle um, makes use of all these resources and um, we're having an impact on the environment through that use. And what's scary is our current collective use is 50% more than what the environment can provide. So that's not sustainable. From my point of view as a conservation biologist, what's even scarier is that the biodiversity part of that previous picture, which is very important for um, a lot of what we use, uh, includes the uh, challenge of keeping biodiversity intact because once elements of that biodiversity disappear and go extinct, they're gone for good. So that's what I'm going to give you an overview for. This will be a preview of uh, uh, the, the author's talk, I'm sure, is a mini version. Um, so biodiversity can include a lot of different things, all the way down from genetic resources like the diversity of the genes in our food supply. Talk to anyone who's descended from Irish people who came to the United States because of the potato famine. Mm -hmm. No genetic diversity in the potatoes, they had to leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, we only have one planet, so we can't leave. So we have to worry about that. Um, and that extends up to communities, including combinations of species, relationships between predators and prey, and things like that, um, and landscapes. That's all important, but again, from a conservation biologist's point of view, a lot of us focus on species as the component parts. Um, all of these aspects of biodiversity have value. They have value to us in a direct utilitarian way. The things we use, that's clearly important, and you can convince almost anybody that, that that's true. I'd like to point out, as I'm sure Sister will touch on, is that there's more to it than that. There's also the ethical dimension. What right do we have to wipe out other elements of, of biodiversity around the planet? So as the title of the book uh, indicates, um, we are in the middle of what conservation biologists refer to as the sixth extinction. The reason that um, Elizabeth Colbert and many other people refer to it that way is that there have been five mass extinctions in the past caused by things like asteroids, such as the one that wiped out our T-Rex here. Um, but um, what characterizes what's happening right now is that we uh, humans, either directly or indirectly, are causing an increase in the background rate of extinction, the rate of extinction that would happen if not for those asteroids and things like that that is perhaps as high as a thousand times normal if you look at the history of life on Earth. Um, and if you look at various groups of organisms, this is, uh, I don't expect you to come away with the details of this slide, but it just summarizes. Uh, this is for the groups that we know a lot about. And one of the challenges in thinking about biodiversity is a lot of groups we really don't know very much. So insects, for example, make up probably half of the animal species on the planet, we don't know much about most of those insects. So a lot of them could be endangered. But if you focus on the ones that we do know something about, the level of endangerment gets pretty scary, especially for certain groups. So I'm a bird guy. About uh, a fifth of birds on the, on the planet are in danger already. Um, so out of the 10,000 species of birds, more than 2,000 are considered, well, uh, roughly 2,000 are, are considered at risk already. And as um, trends continue, those numbers are expected to increase. It's especially bad for groups like parrots, which get <laughs> clobbered for the pet trade and other, other aspects. So there's uh, uh, unevenness within some of these groups. Amphibians are getting clobbered. So amphibians right now are the most endangered animal group 
on the planet. And I'll come back in a minute to what the cause there. In mammals, our, our closest relatives, um, it's pretty bad. It's especially bad for um, animals that we use in various ways, like rhinos and elephants. Also, primates, virtually all of our closest relatives are endangered. Cats, almost all the cats in the world are endangered. So these are the kinds of numbers, even for the species we know about, the, the taxonomic groups we know about, that get very scary. Um, so I'm sure uh, uh, Elizabeth Colbert will, will talk about that some more. Briefly, what are some of the causes? I'm actually not going to say very much about uh, climate change, global warming, because that's a relatively new problem that's on top of everything else. It makes everything else worse. But what we already knew was a major cause of the problem is habitat loss. It's a little hard to see here, especially if you're colorblind like me, that the red bits in here are the chunks of forest, and this brown is degraded forest in places like India, where the human population has just overwhelmed the original forest. So the rate of forest, or the reality of habitat loss, including <coughs> forests and non-forest systems, accounts for a very large percentage of the species that are endangered or have already gone extinct. And a paper just came out this week pointing out that if you look at wilderness areas where a lot of the biodiversity is left, um, we have destroyed 10% uh, of the world's uh, wilderness areas in the last 20 years. That's not sustainable. It'll all be gone before I'm dead if we go at that rate. Second cause is over-exploitation. I mentioned rhinos. Here's a rhino that's been shot with an AK-47 and then had his horn chopped off. That's, it's a war in Africa to keep the rhinos and elephants alive. Um, these are shark fins. So sharks are drastically endangered because in Asia they're a hot commodity for food. So people chop the fins off the shark and throw the shark back in the water and all they keep are the fins. Here's a bunch of parrots being imported uh, illegally. There are parrots you can buy in the pet store that were bred in captivity. That's okay. That's sustainable. The wild capture is not sustainable. And then another factor is uh, introduced species. I'm going to pass around an introduced species I collected right outside the building here. This is the state tree of Pennsylvania, oh. eastern hemlock, and it's going extinct in our lifetime in the state because of the little bugs that are on that twig. Hemlock woolly adelgid, tiny little bug, it is wiping out every single one of our hemlocks. That's just one. This is emerald ash borer. We are going to lose all of our ash trees in the state of Pennsylvania in the next 20 years. I have a 300 year old ash tree in my backyard. It's going to die. It hasn't been attacked yet, but it will be soon. These are the frogs. Chytrid fungus is a fungus that just came out of the, I don't know exactly where it came from, but about 20 years ago, Frogs started dying in many places around the world. Now it's an epidemic where the frog species in some areas are completely wiped out. Uh, this is a rat on an island eating seabird eggs. These are goats on an island, uh, Galapagos, where the goats just destroy all the habitat. So these are all examples where we, humans, have directly or indirectly assisted, either actively move things around that cause problems or sped up the process. And there's a chapter in the Sixth Extinction about the homogenization of the planet. Mm -hmm. So that homogenization means we're moving things around, putting them in contact with species that can't handle it. Mm -hmm. That's especially bad in the areas where the biodiversity is concentrated, which is mainly the tropics. So if you combine those kinds of factors and you go to a place like the Amazon rainforest or the uh, center of Africa, you get some really bad problems. I'm going to highlight one in particular, and that's uh, Indonesia and Borneo. This shows the rate of habitat loss in Borneo. Um, so it's going fast. That's just in the last uh, 40, 50 years. Okay, what's happening? It's a lot of things. Timber, uh, human population growth, but especially palm oil. You mow down the rainforest, you plant a monoculture of palm trees for its oil. This is where our food oil comes from. This is the rate of production. It's going up exponentially. I was just in Costa Rica last year and saw areas in Costa Rica where they're chopping down the rainforest. Costa Rica is supposed to be a good country for biodiversity, but even there, they're facing this trend where uh, there's a lot of demand for it. Where's the demand? You eat it every day. Almost everything you eat has palm oil in it, and it doesn't have to be that way. You can either use other oils that are more sustainable, or you work on systems where you grow the palm trees sustainably. But that's not happening now. They're chopping down virgin rainforest to grow the palm trees. 
Nutella has not made this switch in the United States. So in France, they went to sustainable palm oil. It hasn't happened in the United States yet. Okay, that's just one. There's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, uh, things like coffee. The coffee we drink most of the time here is not grown under the shade. So they chop down the rainforest to plant the coffee trees and grow the coffee. If we all bought bird-friendly shade-grown coffee, that impact would be less. Um, we could grow locally, eat locally produced food, sustainably harvest timber, uh, and alternatives to fossil fuels. That would help with the habitat problem and pollution, but it would also help with the uh, uh, global warming problem. So this is our footprint. Here's <laughs> us. Dark red is not good. So each of us individually has a huge environmental footprint, ecological footprint. The numbers are higher in places like India and China, but each of us has a bigger impact. So you've got to think about both aspects. We can do something about our impact. Those are our choices, both as individuals and as institutions. So there are things we can do to lessen our impact, and we have to do it. I'll just stop there. Thank you. So what's another reason why we need to pay attention to this? Um, our Pope, Pope Francis, who named himself after St. Francis of Assisi, has a deep understanding and um, motivational <coughs> capacity to move us to do something about this situation. And um, I recommend that each of us take this document as bedtime reading. It is very enjoyable. It is not like those usual dense, academic encyclicals. It's the first encyclical of the Vatican that even mentions the environment. So it's our first environmental encyclical. Now an encyclical is usually written for the bishops. This encyclical is written for everyone. And so I have um, an overview of the encyclical just to share with you some of what Pope Francis has included. He's not just talking about global climate change. He says that. He says he's talking about all of Earth and the universe and how we, as humans, need to wake up. And uh, it's a wonderful message. So. So the audience is everyone. This is unusual for an encyclical, as I said. Most encyclicals, the, all, all the other encyclicals are written for bishops, and they're meant to be teachers that will share the information with uh, the rest of, of the church. But this is not just Catholics. This is meant for all people, not just people of faith, all. Everyone. Pope Francis gets it. So he talks, his the subtitle is Care for Our Common Home. And so a big message is the common good. How are we as individuals <coughs> connected to all other species and all other humans as well? But um, he's taking a look at nature and human relationship to nature as a crisis. What the uh, particular emphasis is, is how this is going to affect people who are poor, those on the margins, people who have very little resources to begin with and have had very little to do with that carbon footprint. It is those people, the most vulnerable, the, those who are poor, materially poor, that Pope Francis is very much concerned and wants us to as well be concerned. He talks about it as a spiritual issue. Now, for St. Francis of Assisi, we know that he spoke to the animals. He, he called, you know, brother, son, and sister. He was relational with all of nature. He raises up technology and he draws our attention to what this is doing to us 
uh, in terms of spirituality. How technology can, if, we, if we're not consciously using it, uh, distract us from meditation, contemplation, union with the creator and all of creation. He talks about the positive nature of technology as well. He talks about uh, cures in healthcare, and he talks about the vast uh, communication systems. And uh, he recognizes the positive aspects of technology, but he raises it up as a danger to our being, uh, our evolutionary consciousness, I call it. He, he doesn't use those words, but that's what he means. He means our consciousness, which is evolving, needs to have contemplation, quiet time, meditation, and uh, technology can sometimes interrupt that flow. He talks about the uh, dangers of um, daily life, uh, relationships. He raises the question about progress. Is more, and we've heard this over and over, is more always better? We need, he's calling us ethically to be astute about how we perceive progress. He raises up the issue of our self-centered way and what this is doing to us in terms of not just uh, you know, uh, what we call first world or, you know, the consumer society, throwaway culture. We often think of that as <coughs> U.S., but he's talking about that as a universal concept. And so he raises this uh, issue of those who are poor are the ones who are going to uh, suffer the most. The whole concept of and all Jennifer is one. That Thomas Berry, the passionist priest who, who wrote about the, the new <laughs> origin story, has talked about how we are all connected. And we know that in science, this has now been uh, shown to us scientifically. So he's asking us to be agents of change. And as I came into the campus, I see that uh, Villanova has raised up the concept of change as one of your uh, three principles. So uh, in this document, the, the global priorities are listed here. So, you know, that whole uh, phrase, keep it in the ground. Fossil fuels need to stay in the ground. We need to look at alternative methods of, uh, of energy. And just what we were just seeing here. And um, the international agreements, the Paris Agreement, Pope Francis asked us to pay attention to the reduction of carbon output. You know, and that's that carbon footprint. And what you're doing here, healthy dialogue among all people, not just people of faith, but as people of faith, we are really being called to step it up and to uh, put our faith into action, <coughs> to pray for an ecological conversion, Pope Francis calls it, a change of heart, a commitment to action. And so he asks us to look at the beauty of nature, how can you destroy what you love and what you find awesome and beautiful, wonderful? And so with education of young people, uh, we're trying to add all of this positive dimension that Pope Francis has, has asked us to do. Look at our lifestyle. What is our lifestyle? What would others consider the impact that we personally make on the planet? There's a better way to live. And Pope, Pope Francis in, in the document actually says, we're creating a pile of filth. He uses that word, you know, and uh, he, he doesn't um, use all scientific and technical language. It's very down to earth. 
live with limits. These, none of this is new to us, but he's raising it up as action that has to happen in uh, the immediate future. The systemic change that's needed. We're called to look at systems and how we work with others to influence uh, political systems, economic systems, the environmental system, of course, but uh, social systems and so on. So with community support, like you do here at Villanova, with the action that we have with Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light, and with our church and all denominations, synagogues, and all places of worship, we need to uh, do this together. I have a, a, a paper with websites that I'll leave for your, uh, if you'd like to pick it up, websites to follow up on, uh, on the document. And I have a couple copies of the document if someone needs it, <laughs> if you need it. <laughs> I'm a little tech today. I didn't bring a presentation. <laughs> Can I stand over here? Is that all right? I'm short and I feel like the. I think you need to get out of here. I think, well, then I have to hold this. Oh, okay. <laughs> True enough. Hopefully that stays. Can you yeah. all hear me well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <sighs> wow. I, I'm so excited to be here. I've been here for three years, been at Villanova for three years, and for three years we've been hoping. Uh, that we could find a one book that really addressed sustainability um, and in a way that maybe people haven't heard about yet. You know, a lot of times we think about sustainability as recycling, um, planting trees, the polar bear, right? Everyone seems to keep polar bear. Um, and so this is really just an honor and I'm, I'm so happy to be here, um, just on campus in general, but at, at this panel speaking with this wonderful uh, selection of, of specialists. Uh, so, you know, as Terry mentioned uh, wonderfully in my in my introduction, we made five years of postgraduate sound really interesting and, <laughs> and diverse. Um, my my undergrad was very diverse. It didn't specialize in any one thing, so I'm not going to be able to, to tell you about anything specific on uh, the ecology or, or faith, but I'm just kind of going to do a broad brush of some of the lessons that I think are important, because um, I think that's what sustainability is all about, is just learning how to live on this planet in a way that doesn't hurt others. Uh, and a lot of that to me is just lessons and, and, and just doing well to others. Uh, so I have three main points that I wanted to bring up. Um, one is that we're still learning. I think a lot of times when we're in school, like we're like, we, we think we're learning the penultimate, right? This is everything. And it's not, like every day we're learning new things. That's why we have scientists and, and people doing research all around the world, because we don't know everything. And we are losing the opportunity to learn uh, specifically with the plant speci or, um, species loss um, around the world. We are learning, losing that opportunity. I heard a story recently they found, I forget if it was a plant or a bug or, or something that they thought could cure cancer in the rainforest, and it was just by happenstance. It just, you know, accidentally crawled into some bag and brought it back to the lab. I was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> but we're losing that opportunity, right? If it goes extinct before we can find it, you know, we, we lose the opportunity to save hundreds of lives, um, and we're, we're obviously killing lives by, by losing the species. So that's, that's number one, is that we're always learning, and so never feel like you're done. Always keep moving forward. There's always places to go. Um, this one I, I kind of actually got from a TED Talk, not necessarily. I mean, I got it from the book as well, but uh, nature is everywhere. A lot of times we think we have to drive to a national park or fly, or, or however you're going to get to a national park. Um, to experience nature, right? We have to go on a trail, we have to go, go somewhere. Nature's everywhere. Uh, I mean, really, a, even in a city, um, vacant lots. Um, I remember when I was a student, there was a, t a small little tomato plant growing in between a brick wall and a concrete sidewalk. How it got there, I have no idea, but that, there's nature. Like, it's growing and it's not going to stop. Uh, it's, and we should take advantage and take in what we're seeing. Um, one of the things uh, that hopefully you've seen on campus currents of the Newswire is we're doing a campus tree tour on Friday uh, at 3.30 uh, by Core Arch. Uh, and I like doing the campus tree tour because it makes us stop and look 
at the campus and the nature that's on on campus. We you know we know we have trees on campus, right? This isn't a new new discovery. But do you know what kind of trees? Do you know the history of the tree? Um, we have some species that um, at one point were lost because of um, invasive species coming in, like the emerald ash borer. We have a couple of um, elm trees that have been bred to be able to withstand what was originally done to them. Uh, when was that? 1930s, yeah. Um, uh, we have an uh, American chestnut on campus that was at once uh, wiped out and they've now bred out or bred in resiliency into the trees. So these are all things that you'll learn about um, that are on campus, that are here. Um, walking down Philadelphia, there are empty lots that have plant species coming and taking over the space. If anyone has enjoyed uh, the rail park uh, pop-up garden this summer, an old rail bed that had been abandoned and ignored for years is, is a, you know, a wildlife refuge for any animal um, in the city uh, and should be for humans too. We should take advantage of that and not, not uh, cover it over with pavement. So, so nature's everywhere. Um, and then last, and this is, and this was all touched on by our previous speakers, is system thinking. I think, you know, this is something that I wish our education system um, taught us how to do at an early age. Uh, we want one answer, right? We want a simple answer. We want point A to go to point B. And we, we don't want <coughs> all of this, all this messiness, because it's a lot harder to comprehend and, and to make a decision. But the reality is it is really messy. Uh, we don't know all the consequences that our decisions make. We know some of them. Um, but but we really need to just kind of step back and take make a decision. You know when we're when we're, <coughs> we're buying things, when we're making a decision on on travel, um, you know, or even just what you do as as a profession after you graduate. There are jobs in every single degree that have something to do with sustainability that you can make an impact, uh, and you do make an impact, and hopefully that impact is a good one. So I just encourage you to think about things as a system, because as we learn from this book, we have an impact. Climate change, the ozone layer, all of these have, have impacts. Um, and so I just, we're all connected. I think within your mm -hmm. presentation, I saw that come up. I was like, oh good, I have that written down. <laughs> um, you know, and I, something that's hard to talk about, um, but it is important, is our consumer society. And this, this all kind of ties into the system thinking, right? What you buy uh, does have an impact. Um, and how you throw it away has a huge impact. Uh, you know, so just thinking about, do you need that? Do you have something at home that you could just use instead? Do I need the latest and greatest water bottle, or can I use the one that I've had for the last five years? Because uh, they all, you know, this is great, right, to have a water bottle. You don't think of it as a bad thing. But I love going home to, like, my aunt has two cupboards full of water bottles. I don't, you know, you just, you acquire them. How many people have like a certain amount of reusable bags? We all have, those are all good things, right? But it can be bad if you have too many of them. So, you know, just no matter what you're doing, think about it um, and think about the consequences. You're not gonna know all the answers today, um, but hopefully you'll keep trying to find those answers as, as you grow as, as people and as adults. So, thank you. <laughs> that was so much. And I know that uh, we have a, a little bit of time, and I know that some of you may be running off to classes or meetings, but uh, I think our, our guests have agreed to uh, answer some questions. And if you don't come up with questions, they may have questions of you. So just be, <laughs> just be warned. So uh, why don't we just do this as a, as a discussion? Please ask your questions. Bob. When you read the sixth extinction, it comes across as very almost like things are so bad there's no hope. So, uh, since you taught it, Bob, maybe you could. Well, respond to that. when conservation biology was first established as a discipline, it was by necessity, and it's always been considered a crisis discipline. And the reason we have to have people doing conservation biology is that the problems are huge and getting bigger. Um, so it's a challenge because it does get demoralizing after a while, but um, there are some good news stories. Um, they just, uh, IUCN, which is the UN-sponsored uh, organization that uh, is in charge of keeping track of which species are endangered based on the information that's available and which ones aren't, 
so they rank things as endangered or less endangered. Well, they just had a big conference in Hawaii a week ago, and uh, there was some good news coming out of that. They downlisted, which means reducing the perceived level of threat for giant panda, humpback whales, um, bald eagle came off the endangered species list a few years ago, not because they went extinct, but because they're getting to be pretty common. So when I first came to Villanova 26 years ago, I took my students to Cape May. We were really lucky to see a bald eagle, and you know, so it was rare. Now we go and we see 20 or 30 of them. So that's good. So the, the, there's enough good news to keep you motivated to work on the remaining problems. The scary thing is the trends for some of those problems I listed are not going in the right direction. Um, then you get things like uh, President Obama declared a huge increase in the marine protected area in the Hawaiian Islands, so out towards Midway. Monstrous area, and yet it's still only like less than 1% of the ocean. But it's better. It's, it's you know, increasing the protected areas and doing what we can is keeps you, keeps you going. Probably less for everybody. Uh, my understanding from the census is that the country is more or less 25 percent Catholic, not including you know, a Jewish, uh, Christian, you know, or friends in those faiths as well. And I'm wondering, between our institutions and our individuals, how much of an impact could we have by doing citizen science with Cornell and planting native plants and so forth? Because it seems that you know unbroken habitat is best, but we're everywhere, so it seems like we could at least help the birds and, and the migrating you know, the pollinators. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how can we help as, as institutions, but also as individuals, uh, in conservation of biodiversity? Um, I mean, I can say that Villanova as an institution uh, chooses to plant native or adaptive species <coughs> on campus, um, and I think you know we, and I think all colleges, not just Catholic ones, uh, recognize that we have an impact, both just our campuses themselves, the operation of them. Uh, the carbon emissions that we produce, but more importantly, at least in my opinion, our education of our students, um, making the future generation, or uh, helping the future generation understand these issues and how they can have an impact um, in whatever they study in, in the future. I don't know if that necessarily answers it. Yeah, I'll just add to that that uh, in recent times, the uh, conservation and environmental efforts uh, have been missing the Catholic population, which is next to, in terms of a system of organiz an organized system, it's next to the post office <laughs> worldwide. So uh, I am just so excited that uh, Pope Francis has raised this a notch by writing the first encyclical at this level. And we really need, as, as Catholics, and since this is a Catholic uh, university, and our Catholic identity, if we, you know, are, are proud to be Catholic, we have to do a much better job with others, you know, in the interfaith community to respond from our faith as an ethical, you know, issue uh, much more avidly. And uh, so everything that you're saying, I, I am saying yes. What are our churches doing? And even with, now this is a, a year old, I am saying, where is everybody? You know, why aren't we doing this more? So I'm writing, I'm doing lesson plans for uh, K to 12, and, and I'm trying to get an uh, impact influencing the educational system, but we really need to do a better job as Catholics, and believe me, I'm, Catholic with a small c, you know, I, I believe that all of us need to be doing this as what, you know, Pope Francis says, this is for everyone. But as Catholics, we've got to do a lot better than many, many other denominations have been doing a better job at, at conservation and uh, ecological justice. One of the things that I thought was interesting, <clears throat> especially with, with everyone's talk, is like the, the role that, that we as individuals have. Has there been anything that you've changed within your own habits to be you know, more sustainable or more conscious of the decisions that you're making? 
from shaking my head. One thing is, is bottled water. Uh, right. Uh, eliminating the use of bottled water would be one step. And what I've done, uh, if someone hands me it, I hold it. I mean, I'm not rude, but I uh, don't buy it. My, for my, that, that's something that's doable. You know, I choose not to have it. And, you know, when I see it in the refrigerator in my local community, I raise the issue. You know, I say, how did that get here? You know, so bottled water. And that has a system behind it. You know, the petrochemical system, it's huge. It's not just the water. It's not regulated water. It, uh, tap water is regulated, so you can make changes. But there, uh, poor people. The transportation, it's everything. The right to water. So that's just one little thing, but it has a big impact. You know. I mean, we saw Bill, Bill Nova has saved over a million water bottles by the use of our hydration stations on campus, uh, which we're continuing to expand. So you are all helping with that. Um, and I, I love walking around and seeing all the water, reusable bottles in backpacks and purses around campus. So I, I do know that students have embraced. I mean, not everyone, obviously, but but a good percentage, which is wonderful. I focus personally on the, the shade grown coffee issue because it's so easy. There are all you have to do is become aware of the issue. So as I said, it's in the tropics where they grow coffee. What Maxwell House and the big and Folgers, the big companies do is cut it all down, grow coffee. They get good yield, but it's not the best coffee actually. Whereas the little cooperatives, which is also fair trade, they have smaller organizations that keep the canopy intact, which is good for the birds, good for the monkeys, the sloths, all that stuff. And they get a slightly lower yield, which means it's going to be a little bit more expensive. So consumers like us need to become willing to pay the extra premium because we value the system that's the alternative to the commercial system. Um, how many people know that there are Keurig cups that have shade-grown coffee? I'll tell you right now, San Francisco Coffee Company, buy it. Rogers Coffee, it's the only one. And their K-cups aren't plastic, they're biodegradable. Yeah. So it's a win-win. Why doesn't everyone know this? Why don't we make it automatic that everybody at Villanova who's buying K-cups for their department lounge have them all buy shade-grown coffee? Dining Services doesn't buy shade-grown coffee. They buy Pete's coffee, and Pete's won't say whether it's shade-grown or not. They just don't want to get pinned down. We try. And so that's still an, an issue that's out there. But you can go to Costco. You can go to, full, uh, to uh, Wegmans. You can buy shade-grown coffee, but you get to know to look for it. But it's there. You just, and it might cost a little bit more. So that, for me, I've made that decision to I, just, I won't buy any coffee that's not shade-grown. That's just one thing I can do. And I think just to piggyback off of that, you know, I think a lot of what was discussed here, it's a lot of information, right? And it, it seems like a ton to have to change or, or learn about or adjust to. And so I would just, especially for the students, pick, pick one thing and, and do it. Figure out how you're going to do it and do it. And then move on to the next. Don't try to do all of it today or tomorrow because um, you'll go, you'll burn out and you pick something that you care about. Uh, and there's lots of things that have direct impact on yourself. Um, you know, the, the products that you use on your body or, or and, and the food that you eat have direct impacts on you. So maybe if that's something that you know, makes you more excited and more passionate, maybe more willing to spend more money, which green doesn't always have to be more money, for sure. I save lots of money not buying <coughs> bottled water, but sometimes it does cost more money. So I would just say, you know, pick, pick one thing and do it and then move on to the next. Continually learning, right? It's, and maybe someday we'll learn that there's a better way to do something, and then we'll have to adjust. But that's, yeah. Don't get overwhelmed. Like I, I always worry that people get overwhelmed. Like, I can't do anything. There's so much that's not in my control. There is things in your control. What are some of the things? I, I know, Spot, that you are the uh, moderator of the Ecology Club on campus. So I think that's one um, that I'd like to know more about. But um, how can people get involved? right here, right now. How can we pick our one thing? And I guess the question would be both for um, the undergrads, the grads, and for staff and faculty who are interested. And not just Bob, but 
Unfortunately, well, sister, you may not know what's going on on our campus. But. We actually have a lot of interest in the Ecological Society at the uh, career fair or the uh, activities fair this year. The numbers, you know, getting students to get actively involved in that in, as opposed to all the other activities they have as choices is, is a challenge. But we're trying to, uh, I'm encouraged the, the student leaders to come up with some activities that get students excited in sort of the experiential way so they can learn what's out there and appreciate that it's neat and pretty and um, so get the aesthetic value across to them and then share the information. So networking is, is really important. So even things like Facebook have become a way, and you mentioned uh, eBird and things like that. There are ways of connecting student interest with a broader community and getting the word out about so that once the students learn about some of these issues and what you can do about it, they can then share that information. I always try to press upon my students but that by the time they graduate from Villanova with a degree in environmental science or biology or communications or whatever, um, they know more about these issues and what we can do about it than 99.9% .9 of the population, including about 90% of Congress. You know, seriously, most people in Congress know nothing about any of this. So, you know, there are ways that they can then reach out with other communities mm -hmm. to share that message and call people on it when they're promulgating misinformation. And uh, because our students know what they're talking about by the time they leave here. And they need to take ownership of that and use it. And I think that should be part of our institutional mission yeah. that uh, we can have as much impact, not just by having our students change their own priorities and, and activities, but by spreading that message out as a Illinois alumnus. Definitely, definitely. The, the percentage of Catholics... number 50 school in the country. <laughs> <laughs> the number of Catholics in Congress as CEOs, you know, is, uh, is, is the highest. So, you know, in terms of being Catholic, which means universal, I always like to use that definition. Uh, it's influential when we take our message into wherever we go. I mean, so there's the standard answer of like join a group, right? And if you want to know the list of groups on campus that are most directly um, involved in sustainability topics, you can go to the local sustainability website. Um, but you know, if you're part of a group already that you're excited about and you think could do something to for sustainability. Do it in your group. Like you don't need to join a specific group on environmentalism or sustainability or eco ecology to do something about it. Um, you all have the ability to do so, and I would say uh, continue that trend to your degree program. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to, to push throughout the university is to have a conversation about sustainability for every degree. Right? Maybe not a specific class, uh, like you know, created for it, but in integrated into into your curriculum. So if this is something that is of interest to you, talk to your professors and say, hey, I want to learn more about how this influences. Um, you know, history, you know, how is sustainability influenced in history or, or in any other degree? Um, you know, so, and if you want to influence campus students, uh, you have the biggest influence because <laughs> you pay for all of us to be here. Um, <laughs> you think that you don't, but you do. You really, really do have a huge influence. And so if you want something, do something about it. Start on campus, figure out how your voice can be heard, and then take that to Congress, take that you know, to your local municipality. Um, it sounds scary, and you know, sometimes there's a stigma behind people who, who push for things, but there are people out there that are going to push for the opposite if you don't. So you know, if that's something that you're passionate about, do, do that. If that's not your thing, you know, focus where you can focus, but that, those are always easy and involved. I can't believe how fast the time has gone. Uh, and I wanted to thank, I have to first of all thank our panelists. Wasn't, weren't they wonderful? I knew that we were going to get great information this afternoon. What I didn't know was that we were also going to get such incredible inspiration. And that says that you're not only giving us what you know, but you're also sharing with us your hearts. We, can, we couldn't ask for more than that. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. And uh, if you have a few, if you still have a few minutes and want to ask a question, please do. But have a great afternoon. And make sure I can see my co, yeah. my, both my co-chairs at the same time are going. 
on the 22nd of this month. Elizabeth Colbert will be here. She will actually be right here in this space. Yes. Where's Gina? In this space, signing books at 1.30, signing books. And uh, her presentation will be at 7.30 um, in the, in the um, Villanova room. And I will say, we're holding our breath. There will they'll be in the Villanova room. We have overflow in the in the in the theater. So um, if you want a good seat, I would advise you to go early. Yes. So uh, thank you all for coming. And this is the first of the one book events. There'll be more to come.